know if you've ever paused to consider just how strange everything about the birth of Jesus was, how unusual, how out of bounds, how crazy. Thank you, gentlemen. The, uh, the whole story plays out, and we're going to look at that because in all that God reveals in the birth of Jesus, that the story of how he came to be born in Bethlehem, oh, oh, uh, as the song just said, how strange it was and how important it is for us to see it was into a strange and uh, very broken world that Jesus was born. And it's not that different than the world in which we live. And there are a lot of connection points in the strangeness of the story that relate to our lives just now. We look at the story, the perplexing, the bewildering, the glorious, the frustrating, the fearful, the painful, the unexpected, the disappointing, even the tragic experiences of our lives. And no one really understood why, how, for what cause. But the Son of God entered the world. And not many people saw the big picture at that moment except, except the God who is Lord over all. And sometimes, just for us, the same story. God's working a great and glorious, sweeping, panoramic plan, and it's uh, bewildering to us, too. It all began with an unexpected revelation of the Son of God. Now, this is complex. Some of you, in interacting with other folks, other cultures, wait, there's there's more than one God. God had a son, and that becomes a problematic thing. But in the Bible, God has revealed himself as one God in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all at the same time, not in chronological order, but all at the same time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And for the Jewish people, they did not understand this at all. It was not what they expected, not what they understood he was revealed in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, in this way. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. We didn't value him, yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. But in turn, we regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment of our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. They did not understand his sufferings. In fact, the Jewish people, the rabbis, they believed this was a different person than the Messiah. This was a different role. And yet this, it wasn't the, it wasn't the Savior they wanted but it was the Savior they needed. Jesus comes in unexpected ways. His ways, not our ways. His thoughts, not our thoughts. Those who perceived that Isaiah 7, 14 related to the Messiah, some did, some didn't among the rabbis. In Isaiah 7, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive and have a son and name him Emmanuel. Now Matthew grabs that in the story of Jesus' birth, it says, Emmanuel, God with us. That's Jesus. That's who he was talking about. That's not, that's not how it was understood by most of the people. They didn't take it to mean that actually a virgin would miraculously become pregnant with the Son of God. They assumed that there'd be a chaste young bride and she would become come to know a man and they would be married and in the usual way she would conceive and that would be the Messiah. He would be a, a man, a deliverer, a powerful person who would free his people from uh, oppression. But no one, no one in those days was much believing that Emmanuel really meant 
that God would become flesh and blood and dwell among us, God's ways are much wilder than any of his people were imagining. God's way of doing things much more mysterious than, than they thought. Nor did anyone expect God would choose the backwater town of Nazareth as the place for the child to be conceived and to be raised to adulthood. First of all, we learn the view of the day. John seven fifty two. no prophet ever came out of Galilee. Uh, they, they learned uh, nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. John 1, 46 seems to be the prominent view. And besides, didn't, didn't the prophecy in Micah say that the Savior would come out of Bethlehem? So why is he coming out of Nazareth? They weren't really familiar with the story of Jesus' birth. They just knew he'd lived his whole life in Nazareth. A great deal of confusion. But he did emerge from Bethlehem. But who would have anticipated in the weirdness of this story that Almighty God would prompt Caesar Augustus to carry out an imperial census of the whole empire? And what was his purpose? Well, he was making sure he got all the taxes that were coming to him. It was his main motivation. But in prophetic terms, God prompted Caesar to move everybody in the empire to back, back to their place of origin just so he could get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Mary, by the way, who was how with child? She, I love the King James Version. That she was great with child. That's a wonderful way to express that. Just before she would deliver. All to fulfill what? Fulfill prophecy. And who in their wildest dreams would have imagined that once they arrived in Bethlehem, that God wouldn't have arranged that uh, there'd be uh, the nicest place in town to stay, that everything would be squared away and a place of honor would be reserved for them. But instead, she's moving slow with Joseph and they get there late. And remember, every relative Joseph has in the whole world's in town. They're all packed out. There's no place to stay. There's no, room, no guest rooms in any of the homes, even among Joseph's relatives. And so she ends up... Uh, delivering that baby in uh, probably the, the room where they kept the animals connected to, the, to a, one of those houses. One tradition says in a cave, and it was there that the child was born and laid in a manger. When he was born, there was great angelic fanfare, and it was made to, of all people, shepherds. Shepherds, and we have this great idea about shepherds because we, we do it in these in these glossed over beautiful portraits of these wonderful and spiritually inclined and special people, the shepherds. But they were considered profane. They were considered unclean. They weren't allowed to participate in, in the synagogue worship because they were with the sheep. And I don't know what your view of sheep is, but my view of sheep, I told you this years ago when I was raising a sheep with my sweet little daughter, they're horrible animals. And they're stupid. When, when God said, you're the sheep of my pasture, that was not a compliment. <laughs> they were viewed with great suspicion and confusion by pious Jews in terms of social standing. Whatever your culture. By the way, how many of you, this is my curiosity on a Sunday. How many of you were not born in the United States? Awesome awesome hey we are the world man that's awesome i'm glad you're here I, i'm i'm glad for that you look at your culture wherever you came from and you say this is the lowest of the low in our social structures well that that's what the shepherds were in this structure not esteemed not honored not special why shepherds of all people for this birth announcement and then it gets worse you have to hang in here with me on this one. God took things to a whole different level when he summoned another group of people to welcome his divine son, the magi, the wise men. Magi is just a transliteration where they, they took the Greek letters, put English letters with them. That's how you get magi. 
uh, wise men, but it doesn't really capture the surreal nature of the strange visitors that appear in this story. Of all the unlikely characters and events in this story, they would seem to me to be the most unlikely to be showing up for this. And we just write, well, you know, and then, why well, they saw a star in the east. We've come to worship him. And it all just flows together in a beautiful manger scene. But these magi were pagan Persian priests and astrologers. They discerned uh, truth from the stars in some way. They were experts in sorcery, divination, mysterious magical arts and literature. They were wise in a whole set of things that God had told his people in the, in, in the, in the Old Testament. Don't ever associate with this or with these people. They are never to be among you. And here they come to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Uh, wise in the things that God despised. Somehow through their astronomy, they have, they have come up with some sort of star and they've associated that with a king who would be born in Judea. We don't know what all the nuts and bolts of that were, but God used it in a strange way. Today, if we were going to play this out today, today it would be like God choosing to bypass everybody else, a good spiritual uh, godly bunch of people, and summon through uh, tarot cards or crystals a group of Wiccans who would come to worship baby Jesus. Does that make you cringe just a little bit? Because that's who these guys were. And, and how, how should you feel at the arrival of the Magi in this story? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I look at it from here. Thankfully, it's 2019, and I can look back and see there's a missional connection to all of this for the whole world, for the nations, for those far, far from God uh, are included in what Jesus came to accomplish and to do. And so, we worship alongside pagan welcomers of the Savior of the world. The Magi's role wasn't just marvelous as we continue our journey through this story it blazed a trail of tragedy this is the part of the Christmas story that if you're reading the, the story in Matthew you, you've already skipped the genealogy probably the first chapter when you get to this part of the story you want to skip over these verses quickly just gloss this part over and keep that beautiful warm fuzzy feeling of the manger scene in your mind because they figured if we're going to Judea to find the one who's born king you got to go to Jerusalem and they went to Jerusalem and they they invited Herod the great into this story and he was insanely jealous, killed multiple members of his own family for fear they were trying to take the throne from him. He was uh, evil to the core. And he also had the power of the sword. And this dark horror enters this glorious story. Uh, there's certain, yeah, I'm going to read the Christmas story out of Matthew and the Christmas story out of Luke every year. I don't do this to you every year. But with me, I'm going to read Revelation 12 to get my Christmas story too. Because I want to hear Christmas from the standpoint, the viewpoint of heaven. And there in this sweeping poetic form, we're told about the Satan, the serpent, the dragon who seeks to destroy the child who is born. Uh, that's the cosmic story of Christmas and Satan, so active, wants to destroy the newborn king, the Messiah, the promised one, the Christ, in his, in his manger. So, because he finds out a little bit about this, the paranoid, demonically selfish, evil rage of Herod spills over into sending a military guard into this little sleepy village of Bethlehem and they massacre every male child under the age of two years. Leaving, uh, as the prophet said, the daughters of Rachel to, to weep. There's weeping in Ramah, the, 
land uh, that encompasses Bethlehem. Uh, at the birth of this Christ child, many others, while the child was delivered, the rest of the children were not. And it's one of those times. And we have tragedies. Our news is filled with tragedies. Our lives are filled with tragedies. And when we encounter these tragedies, we wish that God would just roll it all out in a great explanation of why it's working this way and why it's not working uh, the way we would want it to. But we're left with uh, a lot of silence, uh, strangeness, and this, this whole pattern follows through the whole biblical narrative. We know this, again, from this side of the story. That, that child who would be delivered, warned, Joseph warned, taking the child, his mother, to Egypt. We do know that his life was preserved so that at just the right time, according to God's perfect plan for all the ages and for us, that child would die on a cross that was more brutal and horrific uh, than what was experienced by the rest to purchase the eternal redemption of all of Bethlehem's lost boys and bring eternal consolation to any parent who has ever been bereaved. You see the pattern of the Christmas story as we roll it out. I'm glad I could give you an upper on your Christmas. The elements of strangeness in this whole story, and it's a story that one of the reasons why uh, I believe the Bible to be true, there are lots of reasons from archaeology and history and a lot of other things, but one of the reasons is no one wanting to market a religion would have written a story like this with these elements. Uh, it is a testimony to the truthfulness of the Word of God and the power of the message. It's a wisdom alien to sinful men and women. 1 Corinthians 1 says, uh, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God's chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring nothing to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. God does things in the most unusual ways for our good and for his glory. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And that Christmas story, as well as anything in Scripture, gives testimony. So here we are today, halfway through December. And whether you would mark your times right now as today's good, today's bad, this season is good, this season is bad, Christ came with some amazing gifts for each of us to touch a whole lot more, a whole lot more than just Christmas. I want to read a little bit of how God does beautiful things and the worst of things from Romans chapter 5. It doesn't need a lot of amplification because it's so very clear. Or Romans 5, just the first five verses. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only place you're going to find that peace. Now, peace, oh, awesome. Hey, my life, peace. I'm knowing peace. This is wonderful. And there's a whole lot more to that story. We've also obtained access to him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, all still sounding pretty good. Some days that's exactly how it feels for me. That's exactly how the road goes and uh, seasons of my life. And I can say, oh yeah, I see all that. But not only that, not only when it's all going just according to plan and everything is good, hashtag blessed all the time. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know 
that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope and this hope the proven kind of hope not just the I hope but the proven kind of hope in Christ will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us Nothing about this Christmas story was expected as things were unfolding. No one really understood what was going on or why God chose these ways and means to bring his son into the world. And what appeared so strange and foolish to those who were observing it. There are ample things to perplex, bewilder, create awe, enthrall, terrify, frustrate, and disappoint, and grieve in those who experienced the first Christmas and we look around at the world in which we live in our own lives and say, well, Jesus is real in my life and I've experienced him and I've experienced all those same things too. Maybe in the last week, I've experienced all those things, all those feelings, all those things. But you, you, look, at, you look at this overall story back here and I see this big sweeping plan because I live in 2019 and I've been processing this for a long time and so I see how okay God God fulfilled all these prophecies wrapped around even hard things difficult things tragic things all a part of a prophetic testimony to, to say to me in 2019 Jesus is exactly who he said he was and he came to do what he said he came to do to be the savior of the world and I can see all those things and embrace those things however Meanwhile, back at the ranch, here's me in 2019, and, and I live in 2019, not in retrospect today. And uh, you're living today, and we may be in a very strange moment, any one of us uh, today. Things may not make sense, and there is a convergence of you know, odd elements and the unexpected turn of events. And some things in our lives feel bizarre and some just fearful and serious and we feel kind of destabilized a little bit you know disoriented by the whole thing and if so if that's where your story is today at whatever level Christmas comes as a wonderful gift because our God is the God of the unexpected the divine creator he, he chose to become part of his human creation and to redeem us from the most hopeless of things, the most hopeless of miseries and pain and hurt and disappointments. He chose a peasant teenager to bear this divine child and he chose to wield an entire empire to fulfill one prophecy about where the Savior would be born. He chose this backwater hometown. He chose an animal trough as a cradle he chose profane and, and pagan worshipers and welcomers at the child's birth. Chose to allow unspeakable horror to accompany the Messiah's birth, but for redemptive reasons not yet revealed. And that God is the God who is still with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And as Romans 8 says, and if God is with us, and he is, who can really ever be against us? So God sees the big picture. Thankfully, he sees the big picture. And in his wisdom that we can certainly trust, which often to us, to me, oh my goodness, this year has been a year where I do not understand what God's wisdom is in things, though some have come to light as the year has gone on, even in some of those big questions I've had. He'll bring all to right in the ways and the times that will result in the greatest possible for our good, for his glory, and for great joy. The scriptures, as the angels said it to the shepherds, don't be afraid for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Okay, so Christmas time, we sing a lot of songs at Christmas time, remind us Christmas is supposed to be a happy, joyous, upbeat season. Songs like, it's the most wonderful time of the year, and have a holly jolly Christmas, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, jingle bells walking in a winter wonderland, they all communicate 
it's supposed to be just a wonderful, happy, happy time. And, you know, I see lots of wonderful Facebook posts and pictures all over. My friends far and wide and, and everybody's smiling and everybody's looking at the camera and, and the backdrops are just right and everything is framed and photoshopped. And, and some of those families, I know it's not really that kind of Christmas. I'm, there's, there's some other stuff that's car- they're carrying on in deep inside of them. I know the hurts and all, the hard places and the difficulties. And, and you do too. Let me ask you uh, honestly. Is it a happy, slappy, holly jolly Christmas right now? Top to bottom, start to finish. For some of you, personal problems just keeping you from experiencing that joy, and uh, and I can understand. You feel like crisis has run you over. There's an avalanche of things, hard things, that have uh, collapsed on your life. Some of you are so busy wor- and working so hard. There's no time for sitting around roasted chestnuts, whatever that is. Or maybe there's not anything wrong. Maybe there's not anything that's overtly falling on you, slamming into you. But something just doesn't feel right. And for whatever reason, you're just not enjoying this season, this time. It's not the emotional lift you expected. Maybe it's a little bit on the depressing side. The world, doesn't, the world doesn't look like a, a winter wonderland. It, it just feels like winter. Discouragement at Christmas is not an unusual thing. Uh, part of it, I think we just get so hyped up about it. Uh, expectations of the Christmas vacation view of things. You, you set yourself up for failure by overthinking and overinvesting in, in this small season of the year. And the real thing just doesn't measure up. We're disappointed. Christmas can be wonderful, but Christmas can hurt. And sometimes in our culture, we do get an idealized picture of what the perfect holiday is supposed to be like. And we forget this part of it. And that's why I wanted to hit this. Jesus didn't come to that kind of world. And it's still not that kind of world. Not to to a bunch of perfect world people. And that uh, that world wouldn't have needed a savior. He came to a broken world and he came to broken people and he still does. There's a wonderful statement about God way back in the Old Testament, Psalm 34, that says, the Lord is near the brokenhearted and he saves those crushed in spirit. That's a, that, that's a good uh, bathroom mirror kind of verse to keep, to keep in front of you maybe this season. You run through a list, maybe, you know, for you, it's uh, financial problems. You're trying to find a job, find a better job, afraid of losing a job. Bills are piling up. You ever think about this? When Jesus came to this earth, he was born into a peasant family. The Bible says, though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor. If you're having financial problems, guess what? Jesus is good news for you this year. Maybe you're feeling lonely. All these celebrations around Christmas time just... For a lot of people, make it harder. And just remind you how alone you are and how alone you can feel. Jesus knows all about being alone. In fact, at the greatest crisis of his life, at the cross, Peter's denied him. Judas has betrayed him. They all ran. And even on the cross, Jesus expressed, uh, tied to prophecy again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus, I think, would say to you today, I know the pain of aloneness. Jesus is good news for lonely people. Maybe you have family issues. And maybe your family's, uh, imagine this, what if your family was not perfect? Wow, wouldn't that be something? And maybe your family is perfect. In fact, on December 25th, you're going to sit around with your immediate and extended family and It's just a table full of perfectly healthy, emotionally mature, well-adjusted, normal people. But researchers tell us that every family has at least one maladjusted wacko. And if you're sitting in that gathering and you look around that table of family and you say, 
No, I have, these, these people are all wonderful, well-adjusted, healthy, emotionally healthy people. It's you. It's you. For some of you, family is just a complicated word. Maybe there's some brokenness or some disappointment that's wrapped around that world when you think about family this year. And a lot of people uh, don't think much about this, but Jesus had a family. In fact, next Sunday, we're going to spend the whole day with Jesus' family, his crazy, dysfunctional family tree. They didn't always understand him. In fact, after he began his ministry, the Gospel of Mark tells us, when his family heard this, they're just trying to keep up with him. He doesn't even have time to eat, is what the scriptures just said about him. And uh, they, sit, they set out to restrain him. They were just going to tie him up and haul him home. Because they said, he's out of his mind. Well, there's Jesus' family. He knows all about families. You have family problems, struggles, pain, hurt, loss. Well, guess what? Jesus is good news for your family. And maybe 2019 has hit you with other news. And it is that whole thing of, you can go to the doctor for a long time, and then one time you go to the doctor, and oh, man... Maybe it's not you, it's somebody you love. and Maybe you've been dreading Christmas this year because it's, there's, there's, just, there's an empty place, there's an empty chair where somebody you loved used to sit, used to be, and it, it just pains your heart to think about it this year. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And this Jesus who knew all the, the rejection and the failure and the disappointment and the pain and the death the good news is Jesus came for broken people. And I'll tell you this about Jesus. From my experience, he's at his best when things are at their worst. At the core of our human brokenness is sin, and it breaks everything. It causes all those broken places in our lives and in our world. And that's what's messed up our world, and that's what only Jesus could fix. And maybe you feel some of that today. Maybe it feels like a pipe dream to even imagine that's possible. Just know this, through Christ, even in the brokenness of a sinful world and everything that we experience and everything we feel, there is still a lot of room, thanks to Jesus who came, for great joy. Because he is, in a world of bad news, he is good news. I want to finish up with uh, a song Where's my microphone? No, not me. I finish up with a song. And uh, there's a video that goes with it. It's very contemplative, kind of three minutes. But uh, it's, it's that mournful, longing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And it's one of my favorite presentations of it. And the video uh, just bless my heart. I hope it'll bless yours too as we close out.